Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're getting to critical mass, and uh, so I think we're gonna get started in just a second. Um, my name is Nathan Lemer. I am the outreach manager here at the R Street Institute, um, and this is our latest in a series of R Street Donut Dash morning briefings, which is basically just a really great way to have a relatively short, um, not overly in depth, but not not, not in depth, but like gets you back to work on time before your bosses get upset that you've been gone all morning. Um, conversation um, about either issues that we're working on our street or papers that we find interesting from our friends and colleagues. Um, but in this particular case, we're very excited to have a special guest, um, Congressman Will Hurd of Texas. Um, in addition to uh, being like the only James Bond in Congress because he used to be a CIA secret agent, which is totally awesome. Um, he's now a congressman who has really done a great job um, engaging the conversation, pushing the conversation forward about what is the balance between privacy and security. And I think with his background um, in the intelligence community and also his role as a policymaker, that's really been, has informed our conversation and, and we're very excited to have him. Moderating the conversation is Nancy Scola of uh, Politico, uh, and she is formerly the Washington Post. She used to work on the Hill. I did this really on your biography very quickly. Um, and one of my favorite articles she wrote is on, uh, from I think 2012, 2013, on Daryl Issa and the future of the Republican Party and um, tech policy. And as a conservative, it's a very interesting thing for me. And so I wanted to keep that conversation going. Our street tries to be a place where free market ideas and can engage in the tech policy front. Um, and so if you don't know who we are, I'd love to chat with you afterwards. Uh, we are a free market based DC think tank. Um, and uh, we're engaging a whole bunch of issues, but tech policy has been the big one of interest right now. So without further uh, delay, um, I'll bring up our, our, uh, our guests today, start. And because of his schedule, there's a hearing and there's also early votes at 10.15. So if for some reason we have to move it along, um, Mike Godwin will have some conversations over our street is in our tech policy front afterwards. So without further, thanks again. Thank Morning, everybody. Morning, morning. Excellent. So, as a reporter, Congressman, thank you for sure. coming. As a reporter, I'm going to jump on the news. Um, the hearing you're uh, headed off to attend today is on visa applications, the vetting of visa applications, and uh, the issue that's sort of at the forefront of that right now is the use of social media in considering those applications. Obviously, it's sort of ripping off the San Bernardino shootings. What is your take on whether social media should be included in the vetting of? But I, I think I think part of the question on that is is the mechanics. How would you do that, right? And you know, I, I think a lot of employers before they hire someone, they look at the the publicly uh, available you know um, information. <clears throat> How much information, you know, are they outwardly putting? You know, that's open to the entire public on you know jihad and things like that. Um, that that still <coughs> to be known. Um, but I, I think it's a it's a quite it's it's worth having a conversation of how do you do it how do you do it for thousands of people at the same time and how do you do it on you know what's publicly you know publicly available and when you say publicly available is it one of the things that's come up in this case in particular is the use of direct messaging is that publicly available no. if it's if so direct messaging is one thing messages within a Facebook group. I know we're getting into the weeds, but it seems to actually impact whether or not. No, yeah, so, so it's if, if you were to Google your a search for your um, um, colleague, right, and what pops up, and <clears throat> depending on their security settings on Facebook, it allows some things to be public, other things not to be, right? Um, and, and so how much of that is actually out there on some of these individuals? And how do you search that? Is you know for you know the volume is is a is a technical challenge that we have to look at. But <clears throat> you know how, you, you're not going to search. You know if if you have someone applying for a visa, you, you know you can't search their email, right? That's not that's not. And so so the same protections apply to the direct messaging within some of these apps um, that are that are being used. And you know th this is this is one of those topics that. A lot of folks don't necessarily understand, and you know, I, I think there's a lot of misnomers you know, where people are using what's the dark web, what's the deep web, you know, what's the gray web, what's just email, um, and and having a conversation on what all these tools are 
how different you know bad actors and terrorists are leveraging those tools <coughs> and how do we make sure that we're keeping our country safe and protecting our civil liberties at the same time and we can do both we, we must do both and and this is going to be you know this this issue is going to be a huge issue um, for 2016 I think not only here but you know I, I think if you look at um, I didn't watch all the debates uh, I've read enough you know rundowns um, that you know it, it drove it drove a lot of the debate you know the other night on the presidential campaign yeah, can you talk a little bit about your take on encryption? Okay. So, it, it, encryption is an important tool. It keeps it's it's important for national security. It's important for our economy, right? Plain and simple. And we shouldn't do anything to weaken encryption. And and so so that's where I start. And and I also start with we can protect our digital infrastructure. Um, we can protect our country, and we can protect our civil liberties at the same time. Right? That, that, that's where I start on this. And I, I think where this issue of backdoor to encryption, you know, that's really how this, this happens. Is if you know somebody is communicating via an encrypted channel, you already know a lot of other information about them. You probably know their, um, you know, you may know their name, you know a phone number, you know an IMEI <coughs> number on their phone, you know their email address, you may know an IP address that they're using, you know the tool that which they're using from. So there's a lot of information out there that if this is a, a, a bad person and you have a court order document that says, you know, we, you're able to get more information on this person, there's another, there's a, there's a, there's a host of other things you can do to find out information about this person, who they're talking with, in order to thwart, thwart a threat. And you don't need a weakened encryption. And, and so, so this is a conversation that needs to have with law enforcement articulating what is the actual concern. And then, um, you know, technologists and academia and saying, okay, here's a solution to that problem. And because we've already looked, having backdoors to encryption is, is not going to work. It doesn't work. If you give a key to the good guy and the bad guys will get access to this key, it's the exact same debate we had in the first crypto war um, with the clipper chip. And you know, folks that were around then are like, we are literally having the exact same conversations. Um, so I think we'll get beyond this. Um, but it's a, it's important to have folks that understand these things yeah. um, to, to on setting these policies. Are you finding your colleagues on the Hill persuadable on this point? I, I am. I, I think part of it is um, <clears throat> not everybody can explain what how encryption actually works and the keys and public keys and private keys and 128 bit versus something else. But they understand the value of it. Um, and and there's a lot of folks that were around for the the clipper chip debate, so they 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 appreciate that conversation or, or that perspective. And I think when you start explaining it, um, it it it. it they, they get it, right? Um, but it takes a level of explaining. Um, and I think we're going to see that. I think, you know, I, I really do think the topic of encryption, um, the, the going dark phenomenon as law enforcement um, articulates it, um, is going to be a major issue. And guess what? We're not just dealing with this here in the United States. The Chinese government is, is asking for even more and stricter controls, right? The Russians. Right, the Russians just passed a law that basically said that they can over, you know, they don't have to follow um, any any anything that comes out of some of these international international forums. Right, um, so a lot of other countries are looking to use this topic as a way to push and promote an even um, more uh, a larger assault on on human rights. Um, than anything anybody would imagine here in the United States. So, so this is not just confined to um, to the United States of America. It really is a global problem, and there's a lot of other actors out there that we need to be watching and mindful of, and helping our industry and helping our titans of business um, push back on on those requests as well too. So you mentioned titans of business. I'll just to brief you on the debate, if you didn't catch all of right. it on uh, the other night, there was a lot of talk about tech companies doing more. Mm -hmm. It's never exactly specified what that more is. Mm -hmm. um, James Comey, the director of the FBI, has talked about that. President Obama has talked about tech companies doing more. Is there, if there's not necessarily the backdoor question of you know, just
just opening sort of encryption to, to law enforcement. Is there more in your view that tech, the tech community could do? So I, I've been in Congress for 11 and a half months, and one of the things that I think is happening is is law enforcement is talking past the, the tech sector and, and private sector is talking past law enforcement, right? And, and, and that is where that can stop. And, and, I, and I think it starts with <clears throat> clearly articulating the problem. And I don't think law enforcement has done that in, in, a, in a granular enough way. And then once you articulate the actual problem, then, you, then the private sector can be helpful in helping to solve that problem in a way that makes sense for everybody, in a way that, like I said at the beginning, protects civil liberties, protects our country, um, and, and, and gives them the tools when they have that court order um, to do their job. And, and so I think that's where private sector um, can, can plays an important role. <coughs> Academia plays an important role as well, too, in, in looking at some of these challenges. So um, I'm hopeful that we're going to get to a, a place um, but as I've, I've learned, um, being in Washington and seeing how the sausage is made, uh, it's never a pretty sight. <laughs> do you, uh, so you left the CIA in 2009. Nine. Mm -hmm. Do you think um, that predated some of the technologies that seem to be being used in uh, Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Look, look, so so, I, so I, the, the example I use, Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, when, when I was chasing them in Pakistan and Afghanistan, they would do something called night letters. They would write a letter and leave it on people's doorsteps. And this is how they p promoted their messaging, right? Mm -hmm. And you can hit a couple hundred people a night that way. ISIS's ability to leverage social media, um, to hit hundreds of thousands, tens of millions of people is, is unprecedented. And you know, ISIS does four social media campaigns a day that gets translated into 49 um, languages and dialects. You know, the, the leverage they have with all these other entities um, is pretty is pretty sophisticated, right? So these are tools that were just uh, this was just starting to be used, um, you know. On, and I and look, I always say I wish people were using it back then because it also increases your surface area of attack, right? Because if you were an American and wanted to go jo join Al Qaeda, and you sent someone Al Qaeda an email, they were probably going to snatch you and cut your head off. Right? ISIS is hoping people come. And they want to challenge, you know. They want to, you know, parade some English-speaking American as, you know, someone that joined their fight, right? But that gives us I'm opportunities. Sorry, Al Qaeda would cut the head off of an American who suggested they wanted to support. Yeah, just, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, they weren't they would that have. welcoming. To they were not that welcome because yeah. they thought that's a CIA spy, okay. right? And and so so now you have you have opportunities um, to to go after them um, because of of some of this, this use of, of technology and this, this level of openness. Do you think your former colleagues feel stymied by, just returning to this debate that sort of has bubbled up in the last couple of weeks, are stymied by the fact that it is, that for one thing there is more content, even if it's an intelligence resource, there is this content, they're out in the field, but things are bubbling up online that they don't have too much control over, or that there's direct messaging going on, things happening on WhatsApp or Telegram that they don't have access to. I'm trying to get a sense of, is that a minor annoyance across the, the course of your day that this is one area of intelligence you might be able to get to, but hey, it's no big deal, we're always starting by mm -hmm. intelligence sources? Or is this 90, the way that the uh, director of the FBI talks about it, this is 90% of the material that you need to get at, and it's behind locked doors. So I, I think about <clears throat> my time in, the, in when, I was, when I was in the CIA, um, you know, for us, you know, you always go down a path where you can't get access. You don't really, you know, you wish you could know what's, a, uh, you know, in that next, in that drawer, or in that next room, or what that person may have, what's on that computer. And, and sometimes you hit dead ends, but <clears throat> it never stops you from the pursuit of the, the end goal. And so, <clears throat> I am, um, I, I would be curious, and this is, I think, part of the conversation that needs to be had, is you talk about the encrypted communications, how big of a subset that is of the larger fight, right? Um, and and, and I, it's, it's a challenge, don't get me wrong, it's a problem, um, but I, I don't think a case has been made that it's the overwhelming number of things that you, um, you have. So if you look at um, the requests 
that law enforcement has made to certain companies right, for information based on a, 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 a legal document from a judge, that, incre that has increased. So that leads you to believe if you're asking for more information, it's obviously valuable and you're getting something in return so you know you're there you're getting you're getting information that can be useful in uh, the pursuit of of your end goal so so i i i, ha I think um it, it's hard to believe and, and and listen when when i was meeting when i was meeting someone who was giving us secrets they had to make sure they weren't followed i had to make sure that i, I wasn't followed it wasn't like I can just say, hey, meet me at this corner at this time on this date in a text message and text that to them, right? But you did maybe use texting um, and you had codes. And so if, if anybody ever was able to get access to my communications, they wouldn't have a clue what actually I was doing, right? And so it's a cipher. Like, you know, ciphers have been along for a long time. So, so, so bad guys are doing that same, are doing that same thing. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's the old traditional ways of doing investigation, we gotta keep doing that. Um, and you have to protect, we have to protect um, our, the Americans, our American citizens, and we gotta protect um, our civil liberties. But that's a long-winded answer to your question. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so switching gears a little bit, you've been supportive of some of the cybersecurity pr provisions that have been introduced in various forms. I think some of it's in the omnibus bill. Um, that's pending on the Hill. There have been folks that have, I think R Street, for example, not to uh, <laughs> shine a spotlight down on them, that have opposed some of those information sharing between industry and government provisions. Can you explain why you come down the way you have? Sure, uh, and I think the, the, the issue is with whom are you sharing the information, right? And I think uh, privacy world um, industry prefers homeland security. Um, and, and this is what the, 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 the language that's in the omnibus has DHS as the focal point for all information sharing. Um, and it says, you know, he's stripping out um, PII. Um, so so I, I think the debate has been around those two things. And, and the reason I'm supportive of this language is that DHS is the belly button for information sharing. There are strong privacy protection, uh, liability protections. And the privacy um, protections of stripping PII is, is even stronger than what has been in some of the other forms. Um, so I think those are all three things that are good. And, and, and for me, it's, you know, I say this, this cyber, this, this, you know, in Washington, D.C., cybersecurity means information sharing, right? And to me, this legislation is the preface of the book. It's not even the first chapter. And Okay, so if you agree to share information, how do you share it? How is it timely? Is it going to be actionable? Are you making sure the 